Hello Year 9 and welcome to the third story of our gothic horror series. This story is taken from a very famous novel called Wuthering Heights, a novel written by Emily Bronte. Uh, the title of the novel, Wuthering Heights, is a reference to a place. It's a place in the Yorkshire Moors, um, which is just known for its um, really inclement weather which means very bad weather there's a lot of wind um, and gales and it's a very uncomfortable place to live um, there's a lot of kind of overgrown trees and grass um, it's very wild and desolate and at Wuthering Heights, we find the novel's two protagonists or main characters called Heathcliff and Cathy. And uh, Cathy was um, brought up at Wuthering Heights and her father adopted Heathcliff as a child. And Heathcliff and Cathy fell in love. However, because Heathcliff was a kind of adopted outsider with no money, and no family name, Cathy did not marry him. Instead, she married a man called Edgar Linton, who was from a very good family in a neighbouring house called Thrushcross Grange. Now, Heathcliff never got over the loss of Cathy or Catherine to Edgar. He married Isabella and lived his life in agony and fury at the loss of Catherine and Catherine equally never got over her love of Heathcliff and actually fell very very ill and died um, as a result of her kind of inability to live the life that she wanted and marry the man that she truly loved. So Heathcliff is now alone and grieving and very angry and brooding and he's this kind of is a very terrifying figure in the novel and we then pick up the novel many many years later when an outsider not connected with the story called Lockwood comes to visit Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights because he wants to rent Thrush Cross Grange, that other house that Edgar Linton formerly lived in. So we're going to pick up the story. This is very near the beginning when Lockwood arrives at Wuthering Heights, arrives at Heathcliff, Heathcliff's house and wants to rent Thrush Cross Grange and he is attacked by dogs at Wuthering Heights and is forced to stay the night. Listen to what happens to Lockwood at Wuthering Heights. So the narrator, Mr Lockwood, has just arrived at Wuthering Heights, of which Mr Heathcliff is master. Lockwood is being brought to his bedroom by the housekeeper, Zilla. While leading the way upstairs, she recommended that I should hide the candle and not make a noise, for her master, that's Heathcliff, had an odd notion about the chamber she would put me in and never let anybody lodge there willingly. I asked the reason. She did not know, she answered. She had only lived there a year or two and they had so many queer goings on, queer here means strange, she could not begin to be curious. Too stupefied to be curious myself, I fastened the door and glanced round for the bed. The whole furniture consisted of a chair, a clothes press and a large oak case with squares cut out near the top resembling coach windows. The ledge where I put my candle had a few mildewed books piled up in one corner and it was covered with writing scratched on the paint. This writing, however, was nothing but a name, repeated in all kinds of characters, large and small. Catherine Earnshaw, here and there, varied to Catherine Heathcliff and then again to Catherine Linton. Now we, from the backstory, know what this is about. This is Catherine as a little girl. Her maiden name, the name she was born with, is Catherine Earnshaw. And so she writes that name in the wall, as children often do. Children write their name um, in places. And she imagines being with Heathcliff. And so she writes Catherine Heathcliff, imagining that that is her second name. And then, of course, Edgar Linton is the man that she ends up marrying. And so she also writes Catherine Linton. And here we see this young girl feeling very conflicted and um, concerned about who she's going to marry. In vapid listlessness. Now, that means a kind of um, 
just not really thinking. Um, he's sort of in a daydream after seeing this. In vapid listlessness, I leant my head against the window and continued spelling over Catherine Earnshaw, Heathcliff, Linton, till my eyes closed. But they had not rested five minutes when a glare of white letters started from the dark, as vivid as spectres. Spectres is another word for ghosts. The air swarmed with Catherine's, and rousing myself to dispel the obtrusive name, I discovered my candle wick reclining on one of the antique volumes, that means books, and perfuming the place with an odour of roasted calf skin, so his candle is beginning to burn the, uh, the leather cover of the books. I snuffed it out, and very ill at ease under the influence of cold and lingering nausea, sat up and spread open the injured tome on my knee. So a tome is another word for a very thick book. It was a testament in lean type and smelling dreadfully musty. A fly leaf bore the inscription, Catherine Earnshaw, her book, and a date some quarter of a century back. I shut it and took up another and another till I had examined all. Catherine's library was select and its state of dilapidation, that means sort of destruction or something being run down, proved it to have been well used, though not altogether for a legitimate purpose. Scarcely one chapter had escaped a pen and ink commentary, at least the appearance of one, covering every morsel of blank that the printer had left. Some were detached sentences, other parts took the form of a regular diary, scrawled in an unformed childish hand. An immediate interest kindled within me for the unknown Catherine, and I began forthwith to decipher her faded hieroglyphics. And this is her diary. An awful Sunday, commenced the paragraph beneath. I wish my father were back again. Hindley is a detestable substitute. His conduct to Heathley is a, Heathcliff is atrocious. H, that's Heathcliff and I, are going to rebel. We took our initiatory step this evening. How little did I dream that Hindley would ever make me cry so, she wrote. My head aches till I cannot keep it on the pillow and still I can't get over. Poor Heathcliff. Hindley calls him a vagabond. That's another word for a menace. And won't let him sit with us nor eat with us any more. And, he says, he and I must not play together and threatens to turn him out of the house if we break his orders. He has been blaming our father, how dared he, for treating Heathcliff too liberally and swears he will reduce him to his right place. Now, Hindley is Catherine's brother and she is very, he is very cruel to Heathcliff, as you can see, and keeps Heathcliff and Cathy apart. I began to nod drowsily over the dim page. I began to dream. Almost before I ceased to be sensible of my locality, I remembered I was lying in the oak closet and I heard distinctly the gusty wind and the driving of the snow. I heard also the fur boy repeat its teasing sound and ascribed it to the right cause, but it annoyed me so much that I resolved to silence it if possible. And, I thought, I rose and endeavoured to unhasp the casement. The hook was soldered into the staple, a circumstance observed by me when awake, but forgotten. I must stop it nevertheless, I muttered, knocking my knuckles through the glass and stretching an arm out to seize the importunate branch. Instead of which, my fingers closed on the fingers of a little ice-cold hand. The intense horror of nightmare came over me. I tried to draw back my arm, but the hand clung to it and a most melancholy voice sobbed. Let me in. Let me in. Who are you? I asked, struggling, meanwhile, to disengage myself. Catherine Linton, it replied shiveringly. Why did I think of Linton? I had read Earnshaw 20 times for Linton. I'm come home. I'd lost my way on the moor. As it spoke, I discerned obscurely a child's face looking through the window. Terror made me cruel, and finding it useless to attempt shaking the creature off, I pulled its wrist on the broken pane and rubbed it to and fro till the blood ran down and soaked the bedclothes. Still it wailed, let me in, and maintained its tenacious grip, almost maddening me with fear. How can I? I said at length. Let me go, if you want me to let you in. 
The fingers relaxed. I snatched mine through the hole, hurriedly piled the books up in a pyramid against it and stopped my ears to exclude the lamentable prayer. I seemed to keep them closed above a quarter of an hour, yet the instant I listened again, there was the doleful cry moaning on. Be gone! I shouted, I'll never let you in, not if you beg for 20 years. It is 20 years, mourned the voice. 20 years! I've been a waif for 20 years. Thorette began a feeble scratching outside, and the pile of books moved as if thrust forward. I tried to jump up but could not stir a limb, and so yelled aloud in a frenzy of fright. To my confusion, I discovered the yell was not ideal. Hasty footsteps approached my chamber door. Somebody pushed it open with a vigorous hand and a light glimmered through the squares at the top of the bed. I sat shuddering yet and wiping the perspiration from my forehead, the intruder appeared to hesitate and muttered to himself. At last, he said in a half whisper, plainly not expecting an answer, is anyone there? I considered it best to confess my presence, for I knew Heathcliff's accents and feared he might search further if I kept quiet. With this intention, I turned and opened the panels. I shall not soon forget the effect my action produced. Heathcliff stood near the entrance in his shirt and trousers, with a candle dripping over his fingers and his face as white as the wall behind him. The first creak of the oak startled him like an electric shock. The light leaped from his hole to a distance of some feet and his agitation was so extreme that he could hardly pick it up. It is only your guest, sir, I called out, desirous to spare him the humiliation of exposing his cowardice further. I had the misfortune to scream in my sleep, owing to your frightful nightmare. I'm sorry I disturbed you. Oh, God confound you, Mr Lockwood. I wish you were at the... commenced my host setting the candle on a chair because he found it impossible to hold it steady. And who showed you up into this room? He continued, crushing his nails into his palms and grinding his teeth to subdue the maxillary convulsions. Who was it? I have a good mind to turn them out of the house this moment. It was your servant, Zilla, I replied, flinging myself onto the floor and rapidly resuming my garments. I should not care if you did, Mr Heathcliff. She richly deserves it. I suppose that she wanted to get another proof that this place was haunted at my expense. Well, it is, swarming with ghosts and goblins. You have reason in shutting it up, I assure you. No one will thank you for a doze in such a den. What do you mean? asked Heathcliff. And what are you doing? Lie down and finish out the night since you are here, but for heaven's sake, don't repeat that horrid noise. Nothing could excuse it, unless you were having your throat cut. If the little fiend had got in the window, she probably would have strangled me, I returned. I'm not going to endure the persecutions of your hospitable ancestors again. That minx, Catherine Linton or Earnshaw, or however she was called, she must have been a changeling, wicked little soul. She told me she had been walking the earth these twenty years, a just punishment for her moral transgressions, I've no doubt. Take the candle and go where you please, muttered Heathcliff. I shall join you directly. Keep out of the yard, though. The dogs are unchained, and the house, do you know Mount Sentinel there, and now you can only ramble about the steps and passages. But away with you. I'll come in two minutes. I obeyed, so far as to quit the chamber, when, ignorant where the narrow lobbies led, I stood still and was witness involuntarily to a piece of superstition on the part of my landlord which belied, oddly, his apparent sense. He got onto the bed and wrenched open the lattice, bursting, as he pulled at it, into an uncontrollable passion of tears. Come in, come in, he sobbed. Cathy, do come, oh, do once more. Oh, my heart's darling, hear me this time, Catherine, at last. The spectre showed a spectre's ordinary caprice. It gave no sign of being, but the snow and wind whirled wide, wildly through, even reaching my station and blowing out the light. So this is the story of Lockwood's visit at Wuthering Heights. And I think we can all agree it was a most unpleasant visit. He is brought to this room, which Heathcliff normally does not use. And as he tries to fall asleep, he comes across these diaries, the diaries of Catherine, Heathcliff's dead lover. 
and he begins to read about their past together and you can imagine as he's reading he's starting to fall asleep and he hears the branch of a tree knocking against the window and it keeps him awake so he goes to the window pushes it open and reaches out to grab the branch and instead finds himself holding the hand of a little girl and that girl turns out to be Catherine and she begs to be let in um, and of course Lockwood is terrified he, he doesn't understand what is happening and he screams and grabs the wrist and rubs it in the broken glass of the window until it bleeds hoping that he can terrify Catherine away and you can imagine he's making a lot of noise and so Heathcliff arrives at the door and shouts at Lockwood what is this racket you're making and Lockwood eventually explains that Catherine this ghost appeared at the window and we would expect Heathcliff just to ignore that, but he doesn't. He excuses Lockwood, he asks Lockwood to leave. And the extract ends with Heathcliff shouting out the window, asking the ghost of Catherine to return to him. So I would like you to complete three activities uh, based on what we've just read. And you'll find these activities in the Word document that I've uploaded, just so you don't have to keep watching the video. But let me explain what I want you to do. The verses I'd like you to complete this table. I have outlined uh, the different characters that we see and different events that happen. So the first one is Lockwood, when he first, arrive, first arrives in the room. And I'd like you to describe Lockwood's emotions. How does he feel when he first arrives in the room? And then find a quotation which proves it. The same with the ghost of Catherine. How is she feeling when she arrives at the window? And a quotation. How does Lockwood feel when he sees this ghost? And a quotation. How does Heathcliff feel when he discovers Lockwood in the room? And a quotation. And finally, how does Heathcliff feel when he discovers that Catherine's ghost came to the room? So I want you to describe the emotions of the characters at each of those points. And then find a quotation from the extract which proves it. That's the first task. And you'll get a mark for each of those. That's marked out of 10. The second task then is I'd like you to think about fear and violence in this extract. So the quotation which tells us that Lockwood finds this little cold hand is, my fingers closed on the fingers of a little ice cold hand. That's when we're first aware that there is a ghost outside the window. So the first part of task two, how does Lockwood try to make Catherine's ghost let go? What does he do? And you might see a clue there in the picture. Secondly, what other examples of violence can you find in this extract? See if you can find two or three. And lastly, violence, suffering and revenge are key themes in Wuthering Heights. Why do you think the author, Emily Bronte, has included them so early on in her novel? What might she be wanting to do and what might she want her reader to feel? So again, there's two marks for each of those questions. So we're up to 16. And task three then is about the ending of the extract. So what does Heathcliff's, Heathcliff's reaction to the ghost tell us about his character? What, what is he going through? And why do you think Heathcliff does not allow anyone to stay in this room ordinarily? Remember, it's the maid Zilla who brings Lockwood to this room and Heathcliff is angry when he finds out that Lockwood has been brought there. Why doesn't he want people staying in that room? Part C then, the extract ends on a cliffhanger, stating the snow and wind whirled wildly through, even reaching my station and blowing out the light. What is the name of that language device or that literary technique? And finally, can you think of three adjectives to describe the atmosphere at the end of the story? So the total marks available for this are 20. There's 20 marks for this task. And I would like you to submit your answers, please, to Google Classroom for marking as usual. Thank you very much, Year 9. And any questions, please just leave a wee comment um, on Google Classroom.